our, our next talk is uh, by Tamisha Tan, Two Types of Pronoun Doubling in Amarasi. Thank you. So um, good morning, evening, or afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for really putting this together and especially making the transition so seamless in such chaotic circumstances. Um, I'm really happy to be here today to talk about um, Amarasi and the two apparent contexts for pronoun doubling uh, therein. So uh, this presentation is going to focus on uh, two types of constructions in which we find doubling of a full pronoun, a pronoun that is not reduced or not uh, enclitic, and it's found with firstly copula constructions, so when the predicate is nominal or adjectival, as in here, I am a woman, I'll be fake out. And secondly, when you have a quantified or um, yeah, when you have a quantified uh, argument or something with an overt numeral, so hai nuakai, mimne, or something like uh, all of us dream, something like that. And in each case, these two constructions are quite similar because a nominative subject pronoun and its oblique counterpart are both bracketing the uh, intermediate predicate or numeral respectively. And what I'm going to argue about uh, for in this talk is that despite the surface similarity, they actually instantiate two distinct constructions. And in particular, I'm going to try and provide evidence that the first type of doubling with nominal and adjectival predicates involves a pronominal copula hitting a, a pred p. And the second type with numerals and quantifiers involves an argument pronoun doubling construction with a predicative pronoun that actually stays low being doubled by a d hit. So this paper is going to provide some novel evidence for fully agreeing nonverbal couplets that are crucially not t or v, that as has been argued for other languages, but pred. And I'm going to try and collect this more theoretically and to other types of predicative agreement found cross-linguistically and the generalizations we can find about person splits. Um, I'm also going to explore an unusual type of ad nominal pronoun construction, so things like us linguists or we too. And I'm going to say that in Amarasi, what's happening here is that the predicate is also pronominal. And lastly, I'm going to speculate about possibly expanding the inventory of case competitors under dependent case theory. So some background on Amarasi, this is a Timuric language spoken in the Kupang Regency of Southwest Timor, and it's the westernmost end of a pretty complex language and dialect continuum under the umbrella of Uat Meso. So it's not mutually intelligible with the more eastern uh, languages on this chain. The data you'll see here is a mix of original fieldwork I conducted last summer, as well as through ongoing uh, online elicitation, uh, Owen Edwards' work, and also the uh, textual source, which is the Unum Bahasa Dan Budaya's translation of the Bible. So here are basically the structures I'm going to propose for the two types of pronoun doubling respectively. And I'm going to really begin by highlighting four main diagnostics that show that these structures have totally different sizes. Crucially, one of them is a clause and one of them is something much smaller that is an N or DP. And so the first few arguments I'm going to talk about is, about, is going to be about these sizes before we go more in depth as to the head status of the individual constructions. So the first diagnostic that allows us to tell apart the sizes of these two constructions is that only one of them can instantiate a standalone clause. So only if you have a nominal or adjectival predicate can you have just a utterance that says, we are women. You can't say produce something like we are two or we are all, that is not acceptable. The corollary of that is that if you want to use something in argument position, it's only okay with the quantified type of doubling. It's not okay if you want to say we women or us women dream. And this is bolted down to the fact simply that one is a clause and the other is a DP. Um, you can, however, use it as a fragment answer, which makes sense. Uh, the second diagnostic here has to do with negation. So Amarasi has a bracket negation with two pletics, ka and fa, that can surround either the verb itself to the exclusion of the direct object or the entire VP. So you can bracket negate copula pronoun doubling when it's an adjective or a noun, as in a a, kakninu ki fa. But you can't do this with um, quantifiers or uh, numerals. So you can't say hika nuaki fa now. If you want to say you who aren't to go or you two don't go, you would have to move the bracket negation to the verbal predicate itself. So hi nuaki kam now fa. The reason for this is because I argue that the copula pronoun doubling subject, which originates in the specifier of a pred p, uh, obligatorily has to raise higher into spec, pred, uh, spec tp and therefore surfaces to the left of the negation proclitic and all other sentential adverbs, whether temporal, modal, or as we'll see later, also as spectral. So here you see in 9a that it can't remain below the enclitic, it has to raise above it, and that's how you create a grammatical sentence here. And similarly here with the temporal or modal 
adverb of. It has to appear to the left of it. In contrast, there's an independently attested ban on left branch extraction in Amarasi that would prevent any material in the specifier of DP from raising out. So in 10A, we see that there's a ban on possessive WH extraction, for instance, and I've also found a similar ban with relative clauses and with um, just focus constructions in general. And similarly, in 10B, you see that you can't raise part of the argument above negation. You have to pipe, pipe the whole argument, and therefore the whole quantified DP occurs to the left of the negation for clearly. The third diagnostic is pretty similar to the negation facts. Um, only with copula pronoun doubling can you form a full relative clause with an overt relativizer. So you who are Jewish, dot, dot, dot. However, this is not possible with argument pronoun doubling. So you can't say you who are to go. And again, the reason is simply because the subject merged in spec prep P is free to raise out to serve as a head of a relative clause, as I've demonstrated here with this movement across the relativizer. And even more interesting is that the subject DP itself that's doubled can also instantiate a full relative clause. So something like we here, just your servants, us. And this 12B is actually evidence that the two pronouns do not originate uh, in a movement chain because it's unlikely for the oblique pronoun, for instance, to have originated inside the relative clause as well and make its way to clause final position. In contrast, again, because we have left branch extraction, you can't raise the uh, demonstrative, uh, sorry, you can't raise the pronoun out of spec DP to hate the relative clause. Furthermore, the fact that argument pronoun doubling does not admit an overt relativizer is an argument against it possibly instantiating a reduced relative. So although we could translate us to as us who are to, to or we who are to, the idea is that we can't actually make this overt in Amarasi. Instead, as with negation, the entire DP has to occur to the left of the relativizer. The last piece of evidence we have here that one is clausal while the other is a DP is the fact that with copula pronoun doubling, it can actually trigger default third singular agreement, which I'm arguing is clausal agreement. So in 14a, we have here a kind of sentential uh, subject that triggers third singular agreement on the subsequent verb, even though we would expect it to trigger first plural inclusive, which would be talk. Uh, in contrast, we have a pair here that when you have argument pronoun doubling, you have to have the obligatory correct uh, person argument. So we have talk here, which is the correct first person plural inclusive prefix. So here's a quick summary of the main diagnostics I've shown to demonstrate that the two constructions are really of different sizes and how this falls into the fact that one is a CP and the fact that the other one is a DP, you know, um, has the independently left branch extraction, ban on left branch extraction, accounting for the distribution of negation and relativization. So now we're gonna go into a bit more depth as to each construction specifically, and I'm gonna provide more evidence as to why I think it's a PrEP-P and an adnominal construction respectively. Now, pronominal copulas have been attested in a huge range of languages. I've listed only some of them here, in Semitic, in Slavic, in Gaelic, and even in Austronesian. In fact, Sassen observes a possible cluster in Eastern Indonesia and Melanesia itself. And yesterday, Dan pointed out to me that um, the language he works on, Manda, also has a possible pronominal copula. So it's not unusual. What is unusual, however, is that in all of the languages that we found um, that pronominal copulas are, you know, attested in, it is extremely rare for them to show person agreement. So for example, in Semitic, as you can see in 16, it only agrees in number and gender. So you have no person agreement in either case. And Polish and Russian take it even one step further and that you get no agreement, agreement at all. It always has a third singular neuter form because it originates as a, do, a proximal demonstrative meaning this. The facts in Amrasi are the complete opposite. So the copula is identical to the oblique pronoun in every part of the paradigm except the third person. So if you want to have an oblique pronoun in third singular, it is an enclitic e that gets consonant insertion that turns it into either j or gwe depending on the preceding vowel. However, if you want to make a predicative sentence like it is a dog, it is impossible to then have the doubling. You need to just leave it out and just say he dog, basically. So just like a non copula. The same thing happens with the third plural um, facts. The idea is that if you want to have copula pronoun doubling with the third plural, you can't. You can't say sin atuin sin to mean we are people. You have to either have it now or instead use the generalized plural suffix mm, that also shows up, shows up on verbs and elsewhere. So crucially, this is distinct from the plural oblique pronoun, which is the same as a plural uh, nominative pronoun, which is both sin. 
So here I've thrown up the paradigms really quickly. And the crucial part here is that the oblique pronouns and pronomen corpus as we've seen parallel each other almost exactly except in the third person. So previous analyses about the pronominal coppola have speculated that it is either a T, a pret, some other functional head like V, little v, and, um, or something of the sort, or maybe F, you know, I don't want to commit to that. I want to argue that in Amarasi, the coppola is actually a pret head that is categorically distinct from all of these things, and that this is what allows us to get full person agreement, unlike the other pronominal copulas we've seen. So returning to the analysis I gave above, what we have here is kind of similar to what Baker presents uh, with regards to predication in agreement context. But basically, you have a pred p headed by um, the oblique pronoun, which bears uninterpretable and unvalued five features. And this then agrees with the subject that is first merged in a specifier, resulting in identical feature values on both and giving rise to the apparent pronoun doubling when you do the spell out and vocabulary insertion. I'm now going to provide some evidence that this pred head cannot be T or V, and I have four main uh, pieces of evidence for this. The first one comes from word order. So the main evidence given in uh, Hebrew and Arabic, for instance, for the phenomenal couple being T comes from word order facts. However, this completely falls apart if we look at Amrasi because the T is clearly head initial. Whenever you have an a spectral marker, subject agreement, um, a modal, for example, or any other sentential adverb, this always has to occur pre-verbally. Uh, pre the same thing happens with V. V is also head initial where we get consistent V or word order. Now, if you recall, the pronominal coppola obligatorily has to recur clause, occur clause finally. There's no way for it to occur sandwiched between the subject and the predicate in a way that suggests that it really isn't head initial in the same way T or V is. The next fact is, again, we return to bracket negation, which is pretty useful as a diagnostic. We've already seen it can target just verbs to the exclusion of direct object, and it can also target just the spectral morphemes and modals to the exclusion of subsequent verbs. Crucially, it cannot target the pronominal coppola alone. You can't say, I am not a woman by saying, I'll be fake alpha, right? You would have to move the ka in front of the predicate to say, I'll ka be fake alpha or something like that. And the fact that whatever is governing the insertion of this proclitic, whether it's prosodic, syntactic, or a mixture of both, it crucially distinguishes the category V, T from that of Pred. The third and fourth diagnostics are quite similar. Basically, in Amarasi, you cannot find any verbal predicates in copula pronoun doubling constructions, whether this is with or without subject agreement morphology. So let's say you want to create a participle or some sort of gerund to say you are sitting. That is not possible. Instead, to repair this, you would have to normalize it to produce something like you are a sitter or you are a thief, as I've shown here, or a stealer. In this case, this is also suggested that the coppola can't be T because it really shows that the coppola cannot combine with any sort of verbal complement at all. The fact is that serial verb constructions are also very widely attested in Amarasi. You can get strings of up to three to even five serial verbs, all of which show agreement. And so 25A should be grammatical if the oblique pronoun was also a verb since this should count as a valid serial verb construction. Similarly, you can't find prepositional predicates with copula pronoun doubling, so you can't say we are at home by saying we at home us, right? Although this is totally fine if you have it after a verb. And the answer for this is the same as why the ban on verbal predicates exists. It's because prepositions in Amarasi are actually just verbs, with the exception of just two of the uh, so-called words used to introduce spatial and locative meaning, all of the rest of them fully inflect or fully show agreement for person. So in this way, we can just collapse the ban on prepositional and verbal predicates in that this should be valid as a serial verb construction if it were V, but it's not suggesting it's not V or T. So I posit that the best way to account for all of these facts is by suggesting that the pred hit is really a part of a head final projection and it's located below the head initial TP or neck P. And it's incompatibly with verbal predicates follows pretty clearly from the idea that cross-linguistically, one of the reasons we came up with pred in the first place was because there was something that showed up when we didn't have verbal predicates. So this isn't that surprising. So now we're going to go back to the idea of why does the Amarasi pronoun agree when other pronouns don't? To talk about this, we need to look at a related observation cross-linguistically. So Raphael Abramovitz really coined the, recently coined the non-verbal predicate agreement generalization, which basically says that if you have a predicate of context, adjectives and nouns are very unlikely to show person agreement, although they can maybe show number and gender agreement, which sounds a lot like the distribution of phenomenal copulas cross-linguistically. 
So Baker proposes a universal explanation of, for this based on the structural condition on person agreement, where basically first and second person features can only be transmitted in a spec head configuration. Now, I think this could explain why the pronominal copula in Arabic, for instance, doesn't, instance, doesn't agree. Diachronically, it has been proposed that pronominal copulas in Arabic arise from a left associated topic plus resumptive pronoun structure. So your subject in spec CP is resumed by something in spec VP that then becomes grammaticalized as a head. Now, if we try to apply the structure in 28C to, for example, something with a non-third singular subject, we find that it's too far away. It's not in a local enough agreement to uh, undergo person agree, and therefore we find a default. Now, Raphael provides a real counter example to this generalization in Coriat, where nonverbal predicates do show full person agreement. And he argues that this is because in Korea, unlike in Spanish, Swahili, and other languages that don't show the correct person agreement, the agreement is concurring on a pred hit and not something more embedded as Baker suggests as like a F hit, right? And if you notice, this is almost exactly the same structure that I have proposed for Amarasi pronoun uh, doubling in copula constructions. And this allows us to unify the distribution of agreement in both predicative context with a pronoun and also with agreement suffixes. This is also um, nice because taking the third singular to be the most unmarked case, that is the absence of features, it makes sense with, um, with the fact that um, third singular predication in both Amarasi and Korea is no, right? So the only difference in the kind of vocabulary insertion for the two paradigms is what happens in the elsewhere case, aka when it's exponing just a categorical feature. So crucially, a D head with no other person or number of features would be exponent as uh, air, which is supported by the fact that air is actually homophonous with the definite determiner elsewhere in the language. Now, turning very quickly to the second type of pronoun doubling with arguments, which I've, all, um, which I've put on screen here, we can see occurs in subject, direct object, and benefactive position. Now, following uh, Georg Hohn's proposal on at nominal pronoun constructions, I argue that this is the structure in which the oblique pronoun is a D head serving as the locus of person features, and the predicative pronoun is actually merged bearing uninterpretable and unvalued features before raising into spec DP um, to agree with D. And crucially, this is the kind of correct configuration that's close enough to fulfill the scopa and give us full person agreement. Now, I'm going to provide two pieces of evidence for nouns actually remaining low in NP in that they don't actually have to raise to D. And this is based off of Kirby Conrad's recent work on English pronouns. The first context is in restrictive relative clauses. So in line with the standard view that non-restrictive relatives have to join to DPs and restrictive relatives have to join to NPs, it is quite telling that Amarasi pronouns can freely hit restrictive relative clauses. And we can look a little bit more of this data um, later on. The one thing I want to draw your attention to is that in 36C, within the relative clause itself, we don't find agreement between the RC head and the verb, which could be suggestive that the relative clause internal program pronoun is really merged sans um, person features here. Now, the second context I want to talk about is possessive determinant constructions, which is basically when a pronoun uh, directly takes an enclitic determiner, and this forms a new uh, element that refers to the things owned by the possessor that is indicated by the pronoun. So it's basically just like English, yours or mine used predicatively. Crucially, these phrases always trigger third singular agreement when in subject position, suggesting that it's not the locus of person features. And also, the pronoun can take its own plural and clitic, which references the possessum, not the possessor. So this means my things, not our thing. Again, this then suggests that the locus of number features is also not on the pronoun. And so we can separate all of that out. Now, the big question I've left unanswered so far is why on earth does the second pronoun surface with so-called accusative or oblique case, rather the case that's found in direct objects, right? And this is especially puzzling because if you ascribe to an agree theory of accusative case where it's with little v, either the subject... Um, the subject argument pronoun doubling case is not C commanded by little v, or there's no VP at all um, in copula pronoun doubling cases because it's a small clause. I speculate that a possible solution for this is if we say that this oblique case could be assigned under C command by another distinct N or DP under dependent case theory like Baker 2015. Because in both contexts, what we see is that the oblique head is being C commanded by an NP that is not in a movement chain with it. 
So the question then is why would a pred hit be a viable target for dependent case assignment? Why should it count as a case competitor? And I think this could have a diachronic explanation. But diachronically, it is extremely common for pronouns to grammaticalize into couplets. The dem to cop cycle happened in old Chinese and old Egyptian all over the place. So if this pred hit really was a pronoun, maybe Amarasi is just early enough in the grammaticalization process that it retains just enough flavor to you know, get oblique case marking. Although this is still quite speculative at this point. Another benefit of this is that it could explain why pred p is hit final because this could be some sort of inheritance from the fact that dp, which you know the pronoun would originally have been, was also hit final. So very quickly in summation, I've basically shown how two surface similar patterns of pronoun doubling have entirely distinct constructions. And I've also connected typologically unusual facts of full person agreement to more structurally um, general ideas on restrictions in first and second person transmission that patterns with other so-called exceptions to this generalization in languages like Koryak and Tukchi. Um, I've also uh, given two additional contexts in which we could possibly test for the presence of uh, predicative low pronouns built off of English and also Italian, and we'll see how far this can go. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we have, uh, we have nine minutes for questions. Um, so we've enabled the chat. Um, and again, if you would like to, uh, you can you can write towards everyone in the chat uh, and indicate that you have a question. Um, also, I see, so Dan Brodkin has a question. Thank you, Misha. Thank you, Tamisha. Really, really interesting talk. Um, so I, I just have a question about copular clauses in Amarasi in general. I guess I have two questions. Um, one is, are, are these equitive clauses reversible? You know, because in Indonesian, right, you can say like, we are women, or women are women, we, right? And also, do other types of copular clause also allow this construction? So that's a really, really, really good question. So um, I didn't have a chance to talk about it, but pronoun, phenomenal couplers cross-linguistically do seem to have a distribution as to what type of coupler clause they can occur in. So for example, in Arabic and Hebrew, I think they can only occur in equitive and not, uh, not specificational and crucially not predicative. Amarasi has no such restriction. We find this coupler pronoun doubling with all types, like whatever Higgin, um, Higgins kind of... Uh, hierarchy of different copula clauses, all of them are attested. Um, it is, the idea is that if you do want to double it, for example, women are we, the idea is that it would just show up with a null, um, uh, a null pronoun because it would then be third singular or third plural agreement. And it is fine actually to kind of reverse the order of constituents and then not get the doubling, which is kind of what we would predict. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a question from Kenyon, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. Thanks for the talk. I have a question about how this might extend cross-linguistically. So there's a Panoan language, Kapanahua, which I'm probably pronouncing badly, um, that seems to do the same sort of uh, argument pronominal doubling you describe here, but with a slight twist, it always happens with first and second person pronominal subjects rather than those which are modified by, you know, a, a numeral or some sort of relative clause. Um, how would your theory extend to these cases, if, assuming that it should, of course? So I'm, I'm sorry, could, it, could you clarify again? You said that it only happens with first and second pronouns and not with modified? So, so, so it happens with first and second person pronominals even when they're not modified by something like a numeral. Whoa. So you just sort of generally get the stumbling for these, these pronominals and then the third person ones are null and cross-referenced in the verbal complex. So that's really interesting. Um, and would that be a case like, is that used in argument position? I imagine how argument position works because Sub it can't be- Subject position, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I, I have several thoughts on that. For one instance, uh, a reviewer did ask, for example, why don't we expect this kind of doubling just all the time? And there are two ways to look at it, right? So the first <laughs> way to look at it is that, let me go back here, right? You could say that 
Okay, the, um, there's some sort of OCP effect that results in, you know, just a deletion of one of these two vacuous adjacent pronouns if there's no intervening material, for example, mm. um, which would then you would, could say it's just like an Amarasi specific thing because I did look uh, in um, my corpus, for example, and even separated by you know, even in cases where it's not this construction, we don't find any examples of these two pronouns just by accident occurring next to each other, which is quite interesting mm -hmm. as a coincidence. The other idea is I, uh, I was thinking that maybe the difference between a construction like this and just a normal pronoun is that when you have a, just a normal pronoun without doubling that's head movement, where in this case we have kind of phrasal movement to the specifier. And I have yet to come up with a full theory about, okay, why exactly does the insertion of additional number in here result in this kind of uh, phrasal movement instead? But that could explain why when you just have normal head movement in Amarasi, it doesn't. And then perhaps in that language, it's always phrasal movement for some interesting reason, like when you have pronoun rating from N to D. Yeah. That's, that's the, really interesting, yeah. For the, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link to the paper that describes this. Yeah, I tried to write down the, la the, 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 the language that you mentioned. I hope I got the spelling right. <laughs> so maybe you could like- Yeah, no, I'll, 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 send it, I'll send it to you, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We have more time for questions. Um, Matt Pearson has a question. Hi. Um, uh, not so much a question, just an observation um, about uh, pronoun doubling. So another place where you get pronoun doubling DP internally is in Welsh with possessors. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that might be something that's interesting to, to look at. I, I, I take it, since you didn't talk about it, that you don't get pronoun doubling with possessors in Namarasi? No, unfortunately not. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's it's curious why it would just be for predicate uh, predicative mm -hmm. or low pronouns in in Amarasi when, uh, you know, I would assume I, I would I could imagine that in Welsh the configuration the DP configuration that you've got in thirty nine would be pretty similar. Maybe sure. the possessor yeah. starts out in a pos p and then moves mm -hmm. up to the spec of DP and and thereby you know triggers uh, uh, agreement with the D head. So it'd be, yeah. it's it, it'd be interesting to look at. Um, pronoun doubling in, in Welsh versus Amarasi and, and think about why why they yeah. are triggered by different environments. That's really useful. Thank you very much. Also, in bringing up the kind of like, where else can we find pronoun doubling cross-linguistically? Um, this is actually a lot uh, less rare than I thought it would be. So we've already seen like several examples like uh, Panoha and Welsh that you mentioned. Um, we, I've also found this, for example, in Telugu. Someone contacted me recently to say that this is also how Telugu does their predication and ad nominal constructions. So in Telugu, you also get we to us, blah, 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 and we are children us, which I thought was really interesting. So I'm going to get in touch with that guy and talk about it a bit more. The other thing I wanted to mention is that this Koryak data that I mentioned here, um, the thing that I didn't have space to put in is that the suffixes that Raphael posits as predicative suffixes actually look almost exactly like the absolutive pronoun paradigm in all cases except the third singular. So what I would like to posit is that this is actually the same construction. Did we lose Tamisha, perhaps? And I have is, as you can see, quite similar. So it's cool. I would love to hear more examples of this and expand it wider. Okay. Um, we have time for uh, another one short question. Or, or I can ask a quick question if that's all right. Um, Tamisha, can I, can I ask you a quick question? Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so building on the structure of these DPs in the, the DP level doubling, mm -hmm. I'm curious in, in Amarasi or I guess in, in these other languages where this kind of behavior is described, uh, what happens in uh, coordination, right? Do you get conjunctions under the level of the double that feeds the doubling or do you always just get individual doubling if, if we know those facts? That is really interesting and that's not something I tested. Um, so one thing that is possibly adjacent to your question is that when you have a DP like this, you can have an associative adjunct. So you can say we to us, my uncle, and that means me and my uncle, 
where the kind of thing that follows after it is a subset of this. And it looks a lot like what you have in Russian, right? Where you have the instrumental marking and it's a kind of associative add-on. I haven't tried it where it's like, we and my uncle, us, right? Because it would be interesting to see whether the coordinate, what kind of five feature shows up there. That's a really good idea. Thank you. My favorite fact about that is that in my last 20 seconds is that if you want to say something like we three us and then specify there's only one slot. So you can say who one of the three people is, but you can't say two people. So for example, if I wanted to say we three us and I was referring to Keely, myself and you, Mitchell, I could only pick like Keely or you. I can't say we three us, Mitchell and Keely. I would have to say we three us. Mitchell. And then I asked my consultants, okay, but then how do you know who the other person is? And they're like, oh, you know, you kind of guess. It's kind of obvious when you say one of the people who their friends are going to be. So I really enjoyed that. But I need to figure out why this adjoint position seems to only have one slot and furthermore, not allow coordination, which is really interesting. Yeah.